David J. Bob of Hillsdale College wrote a book in 2014 which apparently had very little impact on the 2016 presidential campaign. It was called Humility, an Unlikely Biography of America's Greatest Virtue. I haven't actually gotten to read the book, but I did read an article by the author who says, of all the virtues vital for successful leadership, humility elucidates the most lip service and the least decisive action. It's a hard-won virtue, constantly demanding an honest assessment of, one, of one's real merit. Humility asks us to admit when we are wrong and change course. It counsels putting others first in thought, word, and deed, and it avoids the narcissistic self-promotion so rampant today. So Bob takes examples from American history, such as Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Abigail Adams, Frederick Douglass, and Abraham Lincoln. He sets out to disprove the common theory that humility will lead to failure in real life and to show that humility is the indispensable virtue for greatness. But in each example he cites, humility was a learned behavior. Of George Washington, for example, Bob says, as a young man, his ego was enormous. His ambition outstripped his accomplishments. Portrayed as a stolid, even stony man, Washington in real life was an individual of intense passions. His ability to rein them in has given us the impression today that he had none, but this was not the case. A man of volcanic temper, Vanity was a constant temptation for Washington. He knew he looked good in his military uniform. He was a superb horseman, riding to acclaim through the towns and cities of the newly formed American country. But Washington's early pride led to some hard lessons on the battlefield and in his personal life. Bob says he discovered it is one thing to want to change one's lot in life, it is another to be so eager to do so that the means of self-improvement do not matter. Greatness at any price is not real greatness. Washington gradually realized this, and he calibrated his actions accordingly. Rather than just cloaking his ambition only to exert absolute rule when given the chance, Washington recognized that the more he served others and the cause of justice, the more his success would matter. The less his ambition was about his own fame, the more he would deserve the honors he received. But where would a man like Washington learn this virtue? Bob points to, and I would dwell on, the example of Jesus Christ, who humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. As Matthew 21 shows, he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as a humble king, and his triumphal entry gave voice to very much of God's big story and led to the climax of that story. Now, just for the sake of full disclosure, I have to admit that I have preached this text several times before. It's kind of unavoidable when Palm Sunday comes every year. So those of you with really good memories may find a few parts of this message a little repetitive. As I have in the past, I urge you to hear it and the many scriptures in it as worship. Process this at a deeper level than just your head. Take it to a heart level today. So we'll begin in Matthew 21, 1 through 5, which shows how Jesus' humility and kingship are the climax of God's story. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a colt tied, and a, a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. 
So we're in Matthew 21. Jesus had been moving toward Jerusalem for several chapters, and now he and his disciples reach Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, a suburb of Jerusalem, separated from the city by the deep Kidron Valley. The mount itself stands about 300 feet higher than the temple and about 100 feet higher than the hill of Mount Zion. So it gives you a spectacular panoramic view of Jerusalem, beloved by tourists and artists. On this route, Jesus and the disciples could not have been alone. Thousands of Galilean pilgrims would have been arriving this way for the Passover feast. And it's with the support of this crowd that Jesus creates a deliberate demonstration, a sequence of unmistakable symbols that present him as God's anointed king, the fulfillment of God's big story. He starts by sending two disciples ahead to Bethphage to fetch the animals. He's intentionally setting this up. Verse 3, if anyone says to you, says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them. And he will send them at once. Jesus had just raised Lazarus to life at Bethany, and he stayed there for a few days. It's quite possible that he made these arrangements with a follower, new or old, from nearby Bethphage. He was creating an acted parable. It was a deliberate act of symbolic self-disclosure for those with eyes to see it or after the resurrection, with spirit-led memories to understand these events. So it may be that Jesus or someone else spoke aloud the words of Isaiah 62 and Zechariah 9.9 during the event, or it may be that Matthew and others later recognized this fulfillment of prophecy. In either case, Matthew uses the two Old Testament sources to reveal the significance of the moment. The quote begins in Isaiah 62, but quickly moves to Zechariah 9.9, which promises a king who is righteous, having salvation, humble and peaceful. All of this in striking contrast with the aggressive warlord that the people of Israel were expecting. This humble king, he says, will ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And that's exactly what Jesus chooses to do. It's the only time in Scripture that Jesus is ever recorded as having traveled on anything other than his feet. Now, a few scholars have a problem with the fact that Matthew alone of the four Gospels mentions two animals, a donkey and her colt. But Matthew was an eyewitness to the event. And apparently, he didn't feel the need to simplify this account for the sake of his readers. On the other hand, he may have known that the first gospel written, Mark, said that Jesus rode on a colt that no one had ever written. So Matthew makes it plain, especially with the quote from Zechariah, that Jesus did ride on the younger animal on the colt and not its mother. Matthew wants us to know that Jesus fulfills Scripture. But the purpose of the fulfilled prophecy is to point to Jesus as king. Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey. A king on a donkey would remind people of the way King David once rode away from Jerusalem on a donkey, but more especially of the way in 1 Kings 1 that Solomon was brought to his coronation. And I just really like this scripture this year. Listen to, to the detail here. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jehoiada, and the Cherethites and the Pelethites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. There Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the earth was split by their noise. Even with all the similarities to the triumphal entry, the way Matthew words his quote places the emphasis on one word, humble. Jesus did this humbly. Same word used for gentle in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, and for meek. In the Beatitudes, it carries the implication of strength under control. 
Jesus' act was designed to show that he's the Messiah, but one whose humble arrival will lead him to chosen suffering, not to forceful victory. Jesus' kingdom was in sharp contrast to what people expected. They wanted a Messiah to miraculously free the nation from the Romans and make it the ruling nation. All through the Gospels, Jesus pushes back on attempts to make him take this role. And if they had read the scripture carefully, they would have seen that the Messiah has many roles. Healer, king, rescuer, prince of peace, and especially suffering servant. The problem is that people don't value humility. In fact, fallen people tend to despise humility. And even that is apparent in the prophecy of Isaiah. Many were astonished at you. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Therefore, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. People are not normally and were not attracted to Jesus in his humility. People are not even attracted to the ordinary, which Jesus apparently was. And so when Jesus comes in humility, these crowds are trying to push an idea of Messiah on him, but they're not valuing the humility itself. In fact, it occurred to me that it's only God's common grace, plus 2,000 years of Christian history, that gives us in our culture some remnant of the ability to value humility. And it's only faith in God that gives us the ability to learn humility. One of my favorite World War II examples is the King of Denmark. His name was Christian. He was the 10th King of Denmark by that name. And I suspect he truly was a believer in Jesus, but he didn't start out humble. He became king in 1912 before the Russian Revolution and clung to the pre-war ethos even afterwards. In an episode oddly called the Easter Crisis, King Christian tried to assert absolute authority over the prime minister and the democratic process in Denmark. And though the crisis was peacefully resolved, he was utterly thwarted. Denmark wanted democratic institutions. And King Christian learned from that. His country was invaded by the Germans in 1940, and because they had no significant army or defenses, the nation surrendered on the assurance that they would be able to keep a measure of self-rule. Unlike most of the other rulers in Europe, King Christian did not flee the country, but remained in his capital throughout the occupation of Denmark, being to the Danish people a visible symbol of the national cause. During the first two years of the German occupation, in spite of his age, 70 years old, and the precarious situation, he nonetheless took a daily ride on his horse, Jubilee, through Copenhagen, unaccompanied by a groom, let alone by a guard. An apocryphal story says that one day a German soldier remarked to a young boy that he found it odd that the king would ride with no bodyguard. The boy replied, all of Denmark is his bodyguard. The patriotic song, Der Rieder en Koenig, or something like that, There Rides a King, centers on the king's daily ride. And in the song, the narrator replies to a foreigner's inquiry about the king's lack of a guard and says, he is our freest man. But you see, it learned humility, and his people recognized and valued it. So too, we can learn humility from the triumphal entry of Jesus. Behold, your king is coming to you humble, humble and mounted on a donkey. And we learn it even more, of course, from the events that followed. Paul summarizes this so beautifully in Philippians 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. 
And being found in appearance of a, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalt, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that was above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We see Christ's humility. And this side of the cross, we need to learn not to despise that as they did, but to treasure it as Paul did. Nonetheless, I think we have a thing or two to learn from the Palm Sunday crowd as they hailed Jesus. We, could take, we tend to take Jesus' refusal to fulfill this Jewish expectation as a reason to minimize our own recognition of his kingship and authority. But Jesus did see himself as a king with divine authority, the one who was fulfilling all of God's promises. I mean, that's why he allowed the people to acclaim him. Verses 6 to 11. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed after him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The crowd may have placed garments on both animals, but Jesus rode on the younger, the colt. And this crowd, most of the crowd is really better translated, this very great crowd acclaimed him. And Matthew wants us to see this as an impressive event, not a passing outcry by a few people. So it is a little surprising that Matthew's record does not include an explicit mention of kingship in their cries. The other gospels do. It may be possible that Matthew avoided this because he had already made Jesus' kingship clear in the quote from Zechariah. And there is no doubt that this crowd had kingly expectations. That's the only reason they would call him the son of David. It's the reason they would shout, Hosanna, the Greek form of the Hebrew words, Lord, save us, in the Messianic Psalm 118. Let's listen to that again. as worship to how Jesus fulfills God's big story prophesied in that psalm. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, Hosanna. Save us, Lord, we pray. Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice, that's Jesus too, with cords up to the horns of the altar. So this crowd is celebrating the arrival of the king whom they saw as their savior and rescuer and the one who would fulfill God's promises, the king who was the climax of God's story. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew's point, and the point of all the Gospels, is that Jesus is the king anticipated. He's the king promised. And yet Matthew's point is also that he's this unexpected king, this humble king, soon to be rejected. Jesus doesn't claim any human throne, but he never denies that he is the true king. In fact, when Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, you have said so, a phrase that implies you've seen it. It is this fulfillment of God's big story that we sometimes miss, living as we do in the time between his sacrificial first coming and his triumphant second coming, living as we do in a time when kings are generally not granted 
much authority. But the disciples didn't miss it. His coming as king was announced at his birth. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. They knew this, and the message Jesus brought over and over was the good news of the kingdom of God, which Jesus said has appeared among you. This kingdom is mentioned 18 times in Mark, 45 times in Luke, and 52 times in In Matthew, it's the big idea. And after the resurrection and Jesus' ascension, his people constantly recognized his present and future rule and reign. He's the king. The apostle Paul says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, the last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Jesus is our king reigning now, and he will reign until his last enemy, death, is defeated. This is why in the book of Revelation he's seen as king of kings and lord of lords who will finally come and conquer all evil. So what does it mean to us today that Jesus is king? David Maines wrote a book called Thy Kingship Come that I've liked for a long time. Todd read it recently and really enjoyed it too. And the key definition in that book says the kingdom is any situation in which, one, Christ is recognized as king, two, his will is obeyed, and three, Obedient subjects reap the benefits of his kingdom. That's the kingdom we're in. That's why Palm Sunday is important. It's not just that he's humble, but it's also that he's king. And so we, his people, between his first coming and his second, recognize him as king, and through his spirit learn to obey his will, not our own, and we reap the benefits of the kingdom. And yet, from the Lord's Prayer, we continue to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we glory in his humility, which we should because it took him to the cross to save us, we need to glory also in his kingship and allow him to have the reign and the rule daily in our lives. Finally, in verses 10 and 11, there's one more recognition here. And that's that he's the prophet long foretold. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And when when the Magi came, looking for the king in, in Matthew 2, all Jerusalem was troubled. Now the king arrives again, and the city is stirred, literally shaken by his arrival, the word from which we get seismic. His arrival at Jerusalem was an earthquake, and we sensed that the people didn't know quite what to make of this dramatic arrival. And they asked the Galilean pilgrims, and they said, oh, this is the prophet from Nazareth, which sounds almost anticlimactic after all the keen stuff that we have talking about, that we've been talking about, and maybe it's just the way people refer to him, but the phrase also alludes to another messianic hope the coming of the prophet, based on Deuteronomy 18. John elsewhere reports that when the people saw the signs that Jesus had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. So at least some of the people had a bigger vision for this Messiah than a political figure who would defeat Rome. They had a vision for someone who had come to fulfill all of God's promises, not a mere war leader, but one who would also come to heal, to love, to bring God's mercy to the poor and to sinners, to bring God's justice to the high and the prideful, not acting with man's authority, but with divine authority. And Jesus has already shown by his prophecy of the death and resurrection that he is the greatest prophet ever. He shows them God's reign. Again, I keep thinking of King Christian. 
several legends circulated about his resistance to the Nazis, his willingness, like Jesus, to suffer for what is right. He had become a humble king, not just in outward demeanor, but like Jesus, in his actions. In 1942, Adolf Hitler sent the king a long telegram, congratulating him on his 72nd birthday. I get the distinct impression that at 72, Christian had had about enough of Hitler. His reply merely said, give me my best thanks, King Christian. This perceived outrage, this perceived slight rather, outraged Hitler. He recalled his ambassador from Copenhagen and expelled the Danish ambassador from Germany. And German pressure then resulted in the dismissal of the Danish government, and that led eventually to a full German takeover of Denmark in August 1943. It was then, as we've seen before, that the Germans moved to round up Denmark's 8,000 Jews. King Christian, at great personal risk, encouraged and funded the transport of the Jews to Sweden, and he personally helped negotiate the agreement with Sweden that allowed the Jews to enter and remain. And the people of Denmark, taking moral courage from his humility, humanity, and willingness to sacrifice, made this transport happen. Only about 400 of the Danish Jews out of 8,000 were ever captured and imprisoned. And even then, the Danish Red Cross kept after the Nazis so much that only a very few of those ever went to the death camps. King Christian followed the example of our king willing to sacrifice himself for others. So this is it, the it. This is the culmination of God's big story in a humble king. The story, you remember, started with creation, the power of God expressed in the beauty of his work. Everything was good, but the crisis came early as God's beloved was torn from him by sin, and God resolved to do whatever it took to win us back. Remember, it's a romance, and the whole long history of the Old Testament was the story of how God, time after time, sought to rescue a people so that they would be his people, and he would be their God, and he would dwell among them. Among them. But all of that was simply the lead up to this moment, when God had become incarnate to dwell among us in the person of Jesus, and as the disguised king, he would rescue us from our oppressors, sin and death and Satan. And out of his great love, in deepest humility, he would offer himself for our sin and die in our place, only to rise and take up his reign first, in the hearts of those he has rescued, and soon over the whole world he is saved, which waits for him with groaning. So all of God's big story is voiced or pictured in this moment, in this holy week. He's the humble king, both humble and king, the promised son of David who came in the name of the Lord to a people crying, save us. And he does.